This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and It Never Got Quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. Our guest today is Tom Sterling. Tom went on active duty with the U.S. Army in 1964 as an intelligence officer. He served several positions while in country, beginning with General Westmoreland's staff at Military Assistance Command Vietnam in Saigon. He then assumed posts at division level, traveling the length and breadth of the Central Highlands with the 4th Infantry Division. He had a wide variety of tasks that took in the larger picture of the war, from the geopol geopolitical aspects to confronting its results in the field. Tom left active duty and returned to Cornell University to complete his law degree. He did, however, remain in the Army Reserves, retiring in 1996. Tom took up law practice in Hawaii in 1970 ultimately specializing in mediation, financial planning, and premarital arrangements. He has been listed in the best lawyers in America and Hawaii's top lawyers for many years running. Tom belongs to several volunteer organizations, most notably Vietnam Veteran Leadership Program Hawaii, where he has been the acting chairman since 1986. Welcome and aloha, Tom. Hello, Vic. I could go on accomplishments but you've captivated me with some of the writings that you have sent me. Uh, one in particular, or actually two in particular, was one was called Fixes, the other one was called Snapshots. I'd like to talk about Fixes for just a second. Uh, you talk about the changes that are occurring uh, within the personnel. In, in the intelligence community, I imagine that was, it had quite an effect as far as having some kind of corporate or tribal memory uh, in dealing with the intelligence that was being gathered. Mm -hmm. uh, did that affect the quality of, the, of the, the data that was being collected? Oh, sure. It, it, by the way, this problem was not germane just to the intelligence community. Um, it, it's been said that we did not have uh, 14 or 15 years of experience in Vietnam. We had one year of experience uh, 15 times uh, <laughs> because there was such a turnover of personnel there. Uh, very few of us went over as groups together as a coherent, a cohesive unit. Uh, we were almost all of us replacements and we would take over a job that somebody else had had and try to pick up the pieces and learn what he had learned, maybe without even talking to him because he may have left before you got there. <clears throat> and there was very little opportunities for transition. Uh, I think where there were opportunities for transition, it, it was very helpful. But I was faced with uh, a whole bunch of written reports uh, that I knew very little about and I had to get up to speed on in a hurry. And we had to, uh, and there were new reports coming in every day. So it was a, a, a mass management exercise, among other things, and burning and shredding and destroying stuff that we didn't need anymore, and trying to isolate stuff that, even though it may have been a report from six months or a year ago, may still have some value today. And so that, that was a, a fair amount of what I did. Who prepared these reports? I mean, was this stuff coming from the divisions or? Uh, uh, it was coming uh, up from uh, lower levels of division. It was coming down from very high level 
uh, operations. Uh, there's a lot of it uh, in my very closed uh, area was from uh, CIA, NIA, uh, uh, excuse me, NSA, DIA, all of the letter organizations. <laughs> Um, and a lot of it had to do with intercepted uh, message transmission mm. and satellite photography and things that uh, were very close hold, at least the results of it. And as well as the, um, the, the product of the, uh, the divisions, uh, it was called Radio Research Company. Uh, act actually, it was the National Security Agency operating under a cover name to try and uh, avoid attention to it. That's a lot of what we did, actually, was try to avoid our attention to ourselves. Uh, kind of reminds me of the saying, uh, what is the meaning of all this significance? You have <laughs> all this information mm -hmm. in, piled mm -hmm. in front of you. I mm -hmm. mean, how do you make heads or tails out of it? Well, that's what intelligence officers are for. They're supposed to cut through the wheat and the chaff and uh, identify what's, what's important, uh, what may, what's not important, identify trends, uh, identify uh, tendencies. Uh, in my case, uh, I, I made it a private project of my own to try to assemble all the information I could about where the same enemy units we were facing had done a year ago during the rainy season because we were just about to start another rainy season. And I thought, uh, especially because how the rain affects the terrain up there, that uh, it would be good for uh, the fourth division intelligence staff to know what had happened a year ago. Mm -hmm. I remember you said that uh, you were briefing Westmoreland briefly. Well, I was. I was. Uh, yeah, I was a glorified messenger boy. I was taking a briefcase with very high-level stuff, including personal messages from uh, high-ranking people, and like the Secretary of Defense and the Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, and uh, it. Some officer in our specialized unit had to read it, make sure the uh, margins were correct, there were no typos. As a junior officer, that was me. So um, it, it was, um, I was at risk of having a, a big head very soon because I was always the first guy in his office every morning for six weeks. Not because I was important, of course, but because what I carried was very important. That could be helpful in career advancement, though. Um, yeah, as long as you didn't screw up, which, which uh, I, uh, as far as I know, I didn't with one noticeable exception. Uh, one morning I went in his office and I didn't notice that somebody had put a, a captured AK-47 against the wall, uh, maybe as a trophy for him, and after my chores with him were done, I was in such a hurry to get out that I spun out of my chair, went to the door, and kicked over the the AK-47, so it was bouncing on the floor with the, the business end pointing right at him. And I was thinking, oh, God, it's a good thing this wasn't loaded. <laughs> and and uh, as I, I, could, I could imagine the, the, head, the headlines in the New York Times the next day, Westmoreland slain, gunned down in own office by clumsy lieutenant. <laughs> yeah. So uh, other than that, I think it was okay. Are you sure that wasn't the reason why you were sent to division level? I, uh, I can't be sure of anything, <laughs> Vic. But um, yeah, it, it was um, it, it was time for me to. That was actually a training uh, portion for me for the first six weeks <clears throat> to learn what the uh, special security detachment did and how they did it, so that I could apply those skills to a unit in the field. We had uh, special security detachment had units at all the major headquarters down to division level. And at division level where I was, we also supported uh, brigade headquarters and the uh, advisory group at two corps in Pleiku City. And uh, we had liaison with the special forces intelligence people also. I was just thinking uh, going up into the highlands, again, having this knowledge of what you're looking at from a as you said, a 30,000 foot level, now you're coming down to a lower altitude and trying to make sense of the data that you're receiving from the field mm -hmm. and what you're going to pass on up to mm -hmm. uh, uh, MACV at that point. I mean, you're now acting as the sensor in a way. Uh, did you feel that perhaps maybe uh, the information that was being passed to MACV headquarters uh, from the other units uh, was 
did it have the quality that it needed to have to make good decisions? Hard to tell. Um, it, it was, um, th there was pressure. Well, you, you're talking about, uh, I think, more the operational mm -hmm. the communications than the intelligence communications. There was always pressure on those in the field to send good news up the line to, uh, uh, to the higher-ups. Um, and I, I, people are human. Uh, they, they tried to put a good face on it where they could. Um, the, the officers I admire most were the ones who didn't try to do that. They tried to tell it the way it was. Um, uh, Westmoreland himself was not above trying to uh, make things look better than they really were. Well, I, I think it has been said that uh, we have probably killed the entire population of Southeast Asia several times over with the amount of ordnance that we dropped on the place. Well, uh, a lot of, yeah, we just don't know. I mean, the, the, yeah. there was, it, the, the whole idea of body count was, was not the way to, to manage the war. Um, uh, we didn't know nearly enough about the culture of that country uh, as we should have. Uh, problem repeated in Iraq and Afghanistan. Correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, there are some who speak the language, who know the culture, but not nearly enough of us were. I didn't. I spoke a little French, but that didn't help much in my relationships with the Vietnamese. Makes you kind of wonder, in terms of objectives, you're looking at the first-hand results of what we're doing there and receiving this information from the field mm -hmm. and the higher-ups trying to make decisions as to where we're going to go next. Mm -hmm. And yet there is this political pressure uh, to, to do something. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that we were supposed to be there to prevent the North from taking over the South. Mm -hmm. It was, of course, supposedly us against the communists, but I think at a personal level, it got a little more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't look at it that way today. Uh, it was very personal, which gets us into the, the next uh, essay that you did, which was Snapshots. Mm. And uh, I, I, I'll go into that with you uh, after we have our break, because I think it's a very poignant essay. Mm. But. I, I'm thinking of the quality of uh, the information that made these decisions and how much of that was mm -hmm. just overshadowed by the political de uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. Did you see that a lot? or? Well, um, the political decisions, uh, I saw some of the high-level communications about it. Uh, there were suggestions that we should take the war into Cambodia and Laos long before we actually did. And the high level was absolutely no. And from a tactical point of view, uh, it would have made sense to have these cross-border operations. I mean, there were a number of low-level, um, not supposed to know about it, cross-border operations. But to go there in force would have been a good tactical move, but, but uh, I, I leave it to smarter people than me to figure out whether it was a good strategic move. Uh, if you want to think real, real strategically, one of the best things that happened in the Vietnam War is that we did not get into another war with China or the Soviet Union. We came close, uh, and I, if we had pushed it, who knows what would have happened. Uh, mm -hmm. I am, uh, to this day, um, very sad that we were not able to achieve what we wanted to do in Vietnam. I feel like a lot of others do, that maybe we could have been better somehow. But I don't know if we could have sustained a win in Vietnam. I just don't know, and I don't think anybody knows, the way we were able to in Korea after that war. We'll take a break here for a minute and uh, hear some messages and we'll be right back with, with Tom Sterling. Okay. 
Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I feel alone in a crowd. I can't sleep. I feel overwhelmed. I don't even know who I am anymore. I still have nightmares. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? Thank you for joining us. We were talking about uh, some of the essays that uh, our guest Tom Sterling has written. The other more poignant essay, Snapshots, deals with a more serious and personal struggle. I'd like to read from that essay. It had been raining earlier. Random puddles littered the firebase, soon to be replenished by the dark clouds off to the west. The rainy season had come to the central highlands. I'd been with the fourth infantry division in the highlands for several months and had made scores of helicopter flights around its area of operation. Helicopter sounds were now so commonplace as to be hardly noticeable. I thought I'd heard all the variations, but a new sound suddenly registered, different, off the scale. I could swear I actually felt it before I heard it, a deep rumble, urgent, demanding. I looked for the source, but I didn't see it. The approaching noise seemed louder than necessary. The Huey that soon appeared came in faster than any I had ever seen. The pilot was really driving the bird, foot to the floor. He banked it hard, his rotors almost perpendicular to the ground, then straightened out, flared like a cowboy on a horse, and eased down into some open space, engine still roaring. A few men ran toward it, but what I noticed more were those who weren't. They were briskly but unexcitedly getting ready for tasks at hand. I found myself moving toward the roaring helicopter. I knew instinctively what its cargo was. I felt I had to do something, but I didn't know what. The memories of what followed didn't return until about 19 years later. Never completely out of mind, just unfocused, hidden, put away in the attic. Then one day they unexpectedly came tumbling out. July 4th, 1986 was an exceptionally bright, warm summer day. I was alone in a cottage in Honolulu, drinking coffee and watching Today on NBC. Bryant Gumbel and Jane Polly were broadcasting from an outside location, somewhere looking out on New York Harbor, chatting amiably about the re rededication of the recently restored Statue of Liberty. The harbor was full of anchored warships and parade of tall sailing ships from many nations. After a station break, they cut to Willard Scott, who was standing by at the Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. The U.S. Marine Corps silent drill team was performing an impossibly precise manual of arms with shining rifles, fairly bursting with pride and professionalism. I watched with rapt approval, marveling at their skill and savoring the surge of patriotic feelings. But then I began to notice a counter-surge, an unexpected emotional cross-current there was something about watching these parading young warriors that was bothering me. Something felt dimly wrong here, as if had forgotten the real reason why s such young men are put in uniform and given weapons, not for parades. That's not it. My stomach was going tight on me. Maybe it was the coffee. And some long stored stuff was starting to stir in my attic. <clears throat> I went to the bathroom, sat down, closed my eyes and unexpectedly clicked into a long, impacted, suddenly vivid memory. I started crying. Not just soft weeping, but spring-loaded, unhinged, free-fall sobbing. I was suddenly back in a faraway, unsunny place. A helicopter was roaring. <clears throat> I was with a different group of young troops without any bright weapons or colorful uniforms. They wore muddy, tattered, gray-green jungle fatigues. There was nothing precise about them as they came off that helicopter. Some were on stretchers. Several were carried individually. 
None could walk. Most were barely conscious. All of them had recently been punctured by one or more pieces of high-velocity metal. They each had tags attached as if they were on consignment. The tags would have been filled out by the field medics, alerting the triagers to the not always obvious wounds and doses of morphines already applied. Three of them were laid out on stretchers just above the mud while their helpers tried to shield them from the stuff being blown by the helicopter's prop wash. One had a chaplain for a shield giving him last rites. I instinctively started taking pictures just four snapshots before a wave of shame hit me. What was I doing being a recorder instead of a participant? I was stunned, frozen. I was there but not there, with them but unconnected. What could I do? There's got to be something I could do, but there wasn't really. The medics in the docks had evidently done this before and were efficiently doing all they could be done for these young men. I remember going to one of the wounded who was sitting silently against the surgeon's bunker. He had taken a single round through his leg. Dazed and medicated, he'd been triaged and left to wait while the more seriously wounded were treated. I tried to converse with him, seeking elusive words of comfort and support. Whatever it was came out lame and useless. He didn't seem to want any of it. He just slumped there, holding his head in his hand, trying to wish away the pain and be somewhere else. Tom, I want to thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, that had to have been a deeply emotional uh, <clears throat> piece of writing. And uh, it's not very easy in our society to share those kinds of uh, feelings. But it's, uh, I don't know, we all have those, uh, think those feelings. One of the things that you pointed out at the tail end of this essay was you felt the responsibility or possibly a f responsibility for supplying information that got these guys into this into this jam all i can offer you is that you were doing your job just like the rest of us yeah, so i don't know really what to say uh, other than uh, thank you for your job but these guys we don't know what happened to them and no. I, I know no we don't um uh <clears throat> there are times that, that I read that again and I still cry. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it's, uh, there's no explaining it, it just is. Uh, and I thank you for your comment that I was doing my job, just doing my job, I know. Uh, but there, it, there's, uh, and I, it may have been no connection at all with them. But uh, one of the things uh, about the Vietnam experience, there's a lot of things we don't know, and we just have to hang out with the not knowing. And that's that's not always easy. And um, yeah, I don't know what happened to those guys. They're, they were, uh, they, they had gotten to the aid station. The guys there knew what they were doing. Chances are very good they survived, but not certain. Um, we'll never know. No. Oh. So anyway, yeah. that, that's. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so this experience has obviously had some impact on your life. Do you feel that your sense of compassion kind of led you into mediation? Or um, uh, maybe uh, that's. Um, in lawyer terms, objection, assuming fact, not in evidence, <laughs> that I have compassion. Uh, I like to think so, uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, um, it, as a practicing lawyer, uh, the, uh, toward the end of my trial career, uh, more and more of my cases went to mediation, and I really enjoyed resolving cases that way better than going to trial. And uh, so I became a mediator myself and it's, it's something that um, uh, I get greatest, great satisfaction out of. Uh, there's never any guarantee that we can help people solve their problems, but there's a high rate of success at it. And, uh, uh, and even if there's no resolution or only a partial resolution, people who are in the process frequently say how glad they were that they simply had a go at the process. And that maybe they're 
relationship with one or more adversaries has gotten better even though they don't disagree they still don't agree on everything so yeah mediation is is a um, something I've been very blessed to be a part of uh, for the last nine years that's great that's great <coughs> Given your experience, especially the one that you just uh, we just related, is there any advice that you would give to the returning vets? Um, yeah, keep in touch with each other. Um, be open to talking with people, whether they're vets or not, who are good listeners, who who are willing to hear you out. I think one of the the things I remember after I came back was a lot of people asked me how are you what, what you know how was it but somehow they weren't by nature uh, put together to really stick around for the answer that might be longer than they had anticipated and uh, so other veterans uh, may not be trained mediators or even trained listeners, but they're, they're, they're the ones that they should all keep in touch with. And uh, uh, veterans, I, I can't speak for all of them, of course, but by nature are inclined to listen to other veterans. And um, uh, especially, uh, as we've talked about, there are vet centers here that are made up of veteran counselors or counselors who are veterans or counselors who understand veterans. The, these are uh, amazing resources uh, for anybody that's come back from a war and has any any thought at all that you know maybe isn't, something isn't quite right here or you know I can't put my finger on it and it it's not required that you be articulate about it. You know, all that's required is you be willing to give it a go, give it a, a share, find somebody who will listen. Um, that's all I can think of for other veterans. Well, I want to <clears throat> thank you for what you've done as far as our celebration of uh, Christmas Eve, because it's the only date that we really have to, to celebrate, because we all remember where we were in Vietnam on our own New Year's Eve. You're talking about the 23 December event? Yes. Let me say a few things about that. This year will be the 23rd year that we've had a, a very informal gathering of Vietnam veterans and their families on the Capitol lawn by the Korea Vietnam Memorial starts at 2300 on the 23rd that's 11 o'clock at night that's a teaching aid for those of us who can't remember things <laughs> and the reason we do it on the night of the 23rd is because Vietnam veterans don't have any date that associates with our war there's no December 7 or November 11 but all of us as you suggested that we're served over there remember where we were on Christmas Eve and who we were with and where we were. And on 2300, on the 23rd, here in Hawaii, across the Dateline in Vietnam, it's already Christmas Eve. Right. So it's literally and figuratively going back there. Those of us who associate together are in some ways stand-ins for those that we served with. Yes. And uh, uh, nothing is required of anybody who comes just show up and be respectful to others. Thanks, Tom. I promised I wouldn't make any lawyer jokes during this show, but uh, I have to leave with this idea as far as uh, military intelligence either being oxymoronic or mutually exclusive. We would love to have some feedback. We are also looking for people to interview. If you have some comments or would like to appear on the program, please send us an email at 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would thank, would thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii and for all their support and assistance. Truly without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet. Mahalo. <laughs>